Math is all about numbers. And so let's take a look at some properties of numbers. Now, we all got an idea of what numbers are. And, and, you know, numbers are numbers. You know, one, two, threes, and uh, all these decimals and fractions and square roots. And there's all sorts of different kinds of numbers. For the most part, the numbers that we deal with in everyday life, um, whether they're very large, very small, or somewhere in between, are called real numbers. Um, real numbers are going to be decimals, uh, whole numbers, fractions, and everything. So if we think of this large outer box containing all the real numbers, that's what this R stands for, is real. Now, all these real numbers can be broken up into one of two different types, either rational or irrational numbers. This larger box on the left, this would be the rational numbers. And what we mean by nat rational is that they can be written as a fraction. Right? That's why we use a Q to signal the rational numbers. Is Q is for quotient. We're using this I over here for what we call irrational numbers. These are numbers that can't be written as a fraction. Types of numbers that can't be written as fractions are going to be square roots. Not all square roots, because like square root of 4 is 2, square root of 25 is 5. That's a nice number. Um, but square root of 2 is not a nice number. Uh, pi, it's not a nice number. Uh, the characteristic of irrational numbers, when you look at their decimal representation, is that uh, the decimals will go on and on forever. They'll never stop, and they'll never repeat. That's how you're going to know they're irrational. When it comes to a rational number, that's going to be a number that can be written as a fraction. Um, when you look at that, those decimal numbers, uh, think of some popular fractions like a half. That's 0 0.5. Or a quarter is 0 0.25. Those are decimals that end. Or maybe you've got some other ones like a third being 0 0.3333 repeating. All right, that continues forever, but it repeats. Uh, so if you have a decimal that repeats or ends, it's going to be rational. Included inside of the uh, rational numbers are what we think of as the whole numbers. And these are the ones that um, don't have a decimal part. You know, something like 7 or 138, uh, even negative 15. You know, it's something that stopped. There's no point something afterwards. Now, what we overgeneralize to be, to call all of the whole numbers, um, technically is only this little part. Right. Whole numbers are right here. Inside of whole numbers are what we call um, natural numbers. And with natural numbers, these are also known as the, the counting numbers. So natural numbers are going to be like 1, 2, 3, and so on. All right. The ones that you would count with. When it comes to whole numbers, uh, technically whole numbers are going to be all of those natural numbers as well as 0. So zero is the only number that is a whole number that is not a natural number, right? And when it comes to the z, z being uh, the what we call the integers, right? So right here is the integers. That's going to contain all those counting numbers. It's also going to contain zero. And then it will also contain all those negative natural numbers. So negative one and negative two and negative three, right? So what we generally think of as the whole numbers is maybe more accurately described as the integers being the positive and negative natural numbers as well as zero. Uh, whole numbers being the natural numbers plus zero and the natural numbers being those counting numbers. So here I've got three numbers written down and we want to identify uh, the types of numbers uh, that they are uh, in, in every way that we can. Right? Now, the first thing is first is that every number that, that we're dealing with is what we would call a real number. So negative 23 is real. Square root of 51 is real. And 4 ninths is real. Right. The next thing that we'd want to look at is um, after it being real, it's going to be broken into one of two categories. It's either going to be rational or it's not. All right. Irrational numbers Remember, can't be written as fractions. So a number like 49 or 4 over 9 is rational. Uh, a number like negative 23, because there's no decimal part after it, that's also rational. It can be written as a fraction, negative 23 over 1. But square root of 51, 
type it in your calculator, you're not going to see any sort of pattern there. This is the only irrational one on the screen. After we've uh, split it up into rational or irrational, then we want to check to see if it's any of those uh, integer numbers, any of those integer type of numbers. Um, those are going to be the ones that um, are just the, the whole number types, you know. Since 4 ninths is a fraction, that's where we would stop. Okay? But negative 23, because it's negative, that would make it an integer. Um, when we continue down the line of it being a whole number or being a natural number, um, we want to check uh, whether it's positive or zero. And since negative 23 is negative, that means it can't be a whole number or a natural number. So it's three classifications are real, rational, and integer, uh, whereas the other two numbers only have two classifications. All right, next I, I want to go through the properties of real numbers. And um, as you get more and more in-depth into higher level mathematics, you really get to see uh, how just beautiful and powerful these properties are. Um, however, as an Algebra II student, it seems like a, a bunch of white noise, and it's just obvious that this is how numbers work. So I'll go through them quickly, and, um, and we'll just kind of understand them as, yeah, this is how numbers work. Um, we have, first of all, we have what we call the commutative property, and what that is talking about is order, that um, no matter which way we add or which way we multiply, we will end up with the same number. You know, 5 plus 2 is the same as 2 plus 5. And that works multiplication and addition. However, it does not work for subtraction or division. That's why with all these properties, you know, they're only labeled under addition and multiplication. Another property of order is what we call associative, that if we want to add or multiply three numbers together, we can add the first two together and then add the third. Or we could add the last two together and then add the first one. And either way, we'll end up with the same amount. Just if i got a bunch of numbers to add, we can add them in any order. Uh, next comes the identity property. And this is where it's not exactly the same for addition and multiplication. Addition has its own identity. It's zero. That if we add zero to something, everything stays the same. The identity is what keeps things the same. Right? For multiplication, when we want to keep a number the same, we have to multiply by 1. So the additive identity is 0, and what we call the multiplicative identity is going to be 1. Um, the inverse is what we do to a number to get the identity. So the inverse of adding is going to be negative, or the opposite, or subtraction. All right, for multiplication, the inverse of multiplication is going to be division or making a fraction. Um, lots of times we think of inverse as being the opposite, but it's more specifically the opposite operation. Uh, closure, uh, if we're dealing with two real numbers, then when we add them together, they're going to be real numbers. And when we multiply them together, they're going to be real numbers. And lastly, we have uh, the distributive property. And of course, with the distributive property, you should remember from Algebra 1, that if we have A times B plus C, now notice this one, it falls under both categories because we have addition and we have multiplication at the same time. Uh, with the distributive property, we distribute this multiplication over addition. So that A becomes a factor that we multiply by B as well as by C. So our result is A times B plus A times C. Now, like I said, going through those quickly, that's just for um, some refresher, just a reminder, you know this is how numbers work. When we go through the whole process of simplifying an algebraic expression, uh, when we use an uh, order of operations to help us out, um, what we're also using is those properties of real numbers. Uh, in this example, I got 3 times the t quantity 2q plus r plus 5 times the quantity 4q minus 7r. And it should be recognizable to you that we got one number out here being multiplied by a sum in parentheses. That's going to indicate the distributive property. So I'm going to take that 3 and distribute it inside. When I do that, 3 times 2 is 6q 
and 3 times r is 3r. Same thing happens with this 5. Uh, we're going to distribute the 5 to both of them. So 5 times 4 is 20q, and plus 5 times negative 7r is going to be negative 35r. Now we have some addition, and we also have a subtraction in there. Technically, um, what we would have to do is first call that minus 35 as adding a negative 35 so that we ha all we have is addition. Then we can use those associative and commutative properties to rearrange this expression, maybe putting the Q's first as 6Q plus 20Q, and then having the R's next, 3R plus negative 35R. And when we want to add a bunch of numbers or a bunch of terms together, um, we can associate the Q's together and the R's together by themselves. 6Q plus 20Q is 26Q. And for the R's, we have 3 plus negative 35, which would be negative 32R. Um, last thing would be handling this, adding a negative number. Uh, so we would be back to 26Q minus 32R. And let's finish up with uh, one little word problem. Here we have the price of the components of a computer package offered by the Computer Depot are shown in the table. If a 6% sales tax is added to the purchase price, how much sales tax is charged for this computer package? So we don't need to know what the total is. We just want to know what the sales tax is going to be. And it says right inside of there that sales tax is 6% added to the purchase price. So 6% of the purchase price. We really have two different ways that we could do this. Right? The first way would be I can take 6% of every single item. So when I have the computer being $359.95, I can take that and multiply it by 6%, which as a decimal, of course, is 0 0.06. And the same thing for the monitor. Multiply that by... 6%, the printer times 6%, the digital camera, 149.50 times 6%, and the software bundle for $99 times 6%. Now, I'm not going to bore you and go through each of these individually. Instead, I'll just do them all at once. And then we can add them all together. Now, before I add them together, you, you might notice that we've got a little bit of a problem. And that is that even in the first uh, problem, the 359.95 times 6%, my result is 21.597. Now, within the context of this problem, this is supposed to be talking about money, is sales tax. And I've got too many digits to the right of the decimal. Um, what you can do is just what we call truncate and just cut that off, that we are dealing with dollars and cents. Uh, the same thing with 13.1994. You can just cut that off. Now, you may be thinking, but man, 0.1994, we should really round that because it's so close to 20. You can do that too. Whether you round or truncate, it's okay. I'll be able to, to distinguish the difference, and um, you know, you just go with what you feel. Then we go ahead and add all of these together, and what we should end up with is 54.44, meaning that the sales tax is $54.44. Now, I said we could do this in two different ways. Another way that we could do it, instead of finding the individual sales tax on all of them, we can take all of those values, the computer, the monitor, the printer, the digital camera, and the software bundle, and add them together first. And so we find the entire total to be $907.44. Then 
take that value and multiply it by 6%, giving us uh, an answer of 54.4464. And just like before, within the context of this problem, because we're dealing with money, I only go two decimal places, and so we'll have $54.44. And we see that either way, um, it's going to work out because when we find them individually or whether we add it all up and then multiply by the 6%, that's an example of the distributed property.